called The Battle of Chernobyl. 90 minutes long. It's the best documentary that I've ever seen. And it's good because it's written from the standpoint of the Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. They interviewed Gorbachev. They interviewed the Russian generals who were conducting the liquidation operation. They interviewed the scientists from Ukraine, from Russia. You don't hear that. So I encourage you in four days, if you want to observe that, have a house party, call up YouTube, and get the Battle of Chernobyl and watch it. You will be amazed at what you learn about the Chernobyl business. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, first a comment. Uh, if uh, any of you all hear a politician say to you that there are too many regulations, keep in mind what we, what we learned tonight. And just as an anecdotal reference, the uh, fertilizer plant that blew up, where they allowed a nursing home, a school, apartment complex to be built within uh, Hundred yards or less of some of them as close as 100 yards to this uh, highly dangerous plant. And in terms of regulation, the last time they were inspected was 28 years ago. And they were fined recently, no, so maybe half a dozen years ago, they were fined a few thousand dollars because they refused to develop an emergency plan to deal with a catastrophic disaster, and they said, oh, we, we, we don't have any here. So, you know, I mean, and that's just a fertilizer plant, not to mention. So my question is, um, is there any way that the WHO can be forced to, re to release that report? There have been efforts to try, uh, to, sure not. Yeah, to try to release the report. I believe it was a conference that took place in 19, I want to say 95, uh, attended by over eight or 900 uh, doctors and scientists from all over the country, uh, all over the planet. Um, I, I don't know if there's a way to actually force the release. Other than uh, maybe something we haven't tried. Every, person contacted their member of the Illinois delegation and said they want a copy. I wonder what would happen if they started getting delegates to request for this report. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Yeah, I want to follow up on something CO has to do with the plant. I've seen exclusions of around the Fukushima plant uh, in with the radius in which people are not currently alive. Um, what's yeah. the exclusion zone around Fukushima? Is the question? What's the business? Yeah. Um, you know, I honestly don't know if the Japanese kept it to a concentric circle thing. I don't think they did. I think they actually looked at the plume, and I, I have some maps in other slideshow. This plume kind of looks like uh, like the flame of a butane lighter. It kind of goes out like a teardrop, or there's some colors. Do you happen to know the figure of the largest distance? Oh, it's at least 50 miles. Maybe 70, 70 miles. 70 miles. Yeah, miles. You're only 29 miles from the fire. We have about 10 minutes left. I want to see if anyone here was not asked a question in their time. So we'll get to you two minutes. In the 1980s, Illinois was informed to be one of the temporary repositories for all of This was uh, not only for our state, we were going to take home waste from 12 other states. I'm sure there are other sites throughout the country that we can also pinpoint to do this. Uh, it's amazing that you mentioned this report you just received recently that the can has gone out at the top of this list you see. This time is you're talking about um, the high so her comment was about the low level radioactive waste that Illinois and other states, all other states, in the 1980s were encouraged by the federal government to form these agreements called compacts with other states. And they would work out their own little arrangements on how to dispose of low level radioactive waste. Illinois initially did make that to form a compact called the Midwest Compact with 
many Midwestern states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, a few others. We, in the long run, decided not to do that and instead entered into a discussion and an agreement with the state of Kentucky, which virtually produced no waste. So we, we complied with the technicality of the law that the feds imposed on us by forming a compact with a state that virtually had no waste, which means we'd be handling our own, which is okay. But, 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 here's the kicker. After five years of research on this proposed low-level radioactive waste site that Illinois absolutely had to have, where cancer patients were going to die in the corners of the hospital to go out of state and get treatment, this is what the doctors are saying, well, hold on, not kidding. It's in black and white, sometimes. Five years later, $95 million spent, we reached the conclusion that uh, we don't need it. So we never built it. Right, Martinsville, no, Martinsville, Illinois. A Sheffield is a closed, low-level radioactive waste dump. It was one of six that the nation had. And it was closed in the early 1980s because it had reached capacity and because it was leaking already and it wasn't even closed. So the state of Illinois took it over in a settlement of uh, $7 million or something. And the kicker was at the time that the company that owned it quite righteously and honestly swore waste is not leaking off-site our facility. How did they achieve this remarkable claim? They kept buying up farmland property and moving their boundaries farther and farther out from the trenches. So of course all the waste was staying on site. I suppose when they hit Iowa they're going to have a problem. But anyway, so Sheffield is closed. It is leaking. It does have 30 pounds of plutonium scattered in the trenches somewhere. And it is a dual chemical and radioactive waste facility. So you're right. Where did this report come from that you just received? This one came from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. And who decided Illinois was a The computer model that they tweaked. It's a computer simulation. All right, I'm going to go to the next question. I'll stick around if you, if you want to discuss this a little further. If you have a question. I just want to say thank you very much. We really enjoyed listening to you. Story, so if you just hold on just a second. <laughs> uh, we were talking about this at dinner that you may or may not know that the Philippines at one point was looking to build a nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. This was during the reign of uh, Ferdinand and Ronaldo Marcos. And at the time, Westinghouse Corporation was willing to sell them a thousand megawatt plus reactor, and they were going to build this reactor on what is known as the Bataan Peninsula. Some of you with gray and white hair may recognize your name, Bhutan, and it's very infamous. Mm -hmm. And in its wisdom, Westinghouse decided to site this reactor sort of in the valley amongst three active volcanoes. <laughs> How did they get the contract? They paid Ferdinand Marcos a million dollars and got caught. We, we sort of suspect that they kicked in several pairs of shoes for the company, we're not sure. But this is how business gets done internationally. But don't think it's just Westinghouse and don't just dump on the Philippines. This is the way it gets done on their folks. So that is a real serious issue that should tell you that nuclear power has nothing to do with electrons. Okay, we're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, one more question, one more comment. Who's going to do it? Come on. Have you asked anything about nuclear weapons? How oh, come? No. Almost about nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are fundamentally bad. Uh, What's the connection? Money, politics, and ultimately, as we said here, the infrastructure. Any place commercial nuclear power goes, nuclear weapons follow. But the one kicker, the one ace in the hole, the fact that I have a piece here called The Connection Between Nuclear Power and Weapons. It's a quotation that I lifted from an early 1950s Commonwealth Edison shareholders report. I'm not making this up. Now, early 50s, this was even before Adams for Peace, Eisenhower. But ComEd is reporting back to its shareholders, as they are legally required to do. And they said, we've been approached by the government about this new technology called 
tongues. And what it might do is uh, provide a very abundant source of very cheap or possibly even free electricity, uh, you know, very low cost electricity, large quantities of it. But the, best, but the best part, get this, I'm glad you're all sitting down. The best part is the government assures us that they will be happy to buy back the radioactive waste so they can make nuclear weapons in black and white. Now I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but the actual quote is in the document here if you want to go see it. Commonwealth Edison shareholders report, early 1950s. So what's the connection seal? Of London. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to be more than patient. I want you to be epic outraged. I want you to go back and throw open your windows and stick your head out and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore and stop these people before they stop you. Thank you very much. Don't they violate the Patriot Act and then they can lock you up? I'll find a reason to lock us up.